Welcome back, everyone. This is the Eccles Unlimited podcast. I'm your host, Terrence Eccles. And this is my ninth episode of the Eccles Unlimited podcast. I am so glad to be on nine episodes. I enjoy getting on here and talking about the thing that I love, which is the game of basketball. So we're going to get right into it today. It's August 3rd, 2019. Uh, Today we're going to talk about the FIBA World Cup, uh, the basketball tournament, and then I'm going to give my brief thoughts about the Russell Westbrook and Chris Paul trade because I forgot I haven't touched on that. I somewhat touched on it in my free agency podcast. I, I want to just get get more into it. If you want to go back and listen to my free agency podcast, that was in my last episode. Uh, it's it's a long one. It's, it's about 50 minutes. It's my uh, episode eight of this podcast. So you can go check that out if you're interested in my thoughts on the free agency. But uh, today I'm just going to get right into it talking about the FIBA World Cup. Okay, so this year the FIBA, which is the basketball version of the FIFA, which is for soccer or football, whatever you want to call it, whatever country you live in. Uh, It's the basketball equivalent. They have a world championships. They have a world cup every four years, just like in soccer. And this year, their host, this year it's being held in China. It is being held from August 31st to September 15th, 2019. I'm always excited to watch the FIBA World Cup. I'm always excited to see which teams have the star power to challenge the United States. I'm excited to see what players the United States puts out. I'm excited to see what players are able to shine in the international game and what players uh, somewhat struggle in the international game. So it's a great event. It's a great time. It's this year is a little bit later than normal, which is why we're having so many difficult so many players are making difficult decisions not to play and represent their countries it's too bad but it's it's a great opportunity for a lot of the young guys especially in the united states the young guys who would never get even a look to play international basketball and now they're having an opportunity to not only come into training camp and train but an opportunity to earn a roster spot and play and represent the united states in this year's world cup so i'm very excited for that but the problem with this year and it being so late and there being so many players moving teams and getting traded and so many free agency decisions being made and it's just so hectic. The NBA is such in such a frenzy right now that there are some players on Team USA who have dropped out and they have had a lot of dropouts, uh, so, some to name a few are Anthony Davis, James Harden, Eric Gordon, C.J. McCollum, Bradley Beal, Damian Lillard, Tobias Harris, Zion Williamson, Paul Millsap, and Kevin Love. And as of earlier this week, I also saw that DeAndre or Andre Drummond has also dropped out. So the U.S. roster is going to look a lot more thin than it originally had planned. And that's even more concerning because... That's not even including the guys like LeBron James, Kevin Durant, Steph Curry, Kawhi Leonard, who didn't even weren't even didn't even put their names in to be a part of the Team USA training camp or the Team USA team for the 2019 FIBA World Cup. So the fact that you don't get the big stars, that's fine. You you can do without the LeBrons and the KDs and the Stephs, but when guys like CJ McCollum and Tobias Harris, like the guys who you want to see break out and become bona fide stars in the NBA or declining the opportunity to represent the United States, it's it's too bad. And I know a lot of these guys, they just signed new deals. They don't want to get hurt. CJ just signed for three years, $100 million. Shout out to him. He, he definitely deserves it. I'm excited to watch him and Damian Lillard tear up the Western Conference for the next few years. They will, they're the Portland Trailblazers are in great hands with those two guys in their backcourt. And I'm glad that they both got paid. I'm glad that they are both there for a long time. They're both loyal. It's a great opportunity. It's a Everyone wins in this scenario. Portland, the city of Portland wins because they have stars that they can go out and watch every night. The players win, obviously, because they make money. They're able to stay in their current situation, a place where they're comfortable. And the team wins because... You have two great players who play really well together that want to be together, they are together, and they are locked up to stay together for a long time. 
and I'm glad that he was able to do that. So the current roster, uh, it looks a little thin uh, in in terms of the star the star category, but I, I'm not too concerned. the The current roster that the United States is able to put out is probably going to look like Kemba Walker, Donovan Mitchell, Kyle Lowry if he gets over his hand injury, uh, Marcus Smart, Chris Middleton. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Harrison Barnes, P.J. Tucker, Miles Turner, Kyle Kuzma, Kuzma, who I also believe uh, just dropped out, so I'm going to have to remove his name from my notes, Uh, Brooke Lopez, Thaddeus Thaddeus Young, and Mason Plumlee. So they have guards, they have a couple wings, and Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Chris Middleton, who can play, a couple forwards like Harrison Barnes, P.J. Tucker, and then they have a couple bigs like Miles Turner and Thaddeus Young and Mason Plumlee. So I, I don't I don't see the U.S. having much trouble this year. It's going to be different this year because normally the U.S. in the past has gotten guys like Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, uh, Carmelo Anthony to compete and play when they were at the top of their games. So the fact that the U.S. doesn't have any of the bona fide stars in the NBA really playing. I know Kemba is going to be probably the main guy on this year's team, and guys like Donovan Mitchell and Jason Tatum now have the opportunity to help lead the team and be those go-to scorers and show that they can make the next step from becoming a great young player in the NBA to becoming a consensus great player in the NBA to where they have the that. They've reached that level to where they can be the best player on a playoff or a championship caliber team. So they have shown the potential to do that, and I'm excited to see where they're able to go from there. Uh, One of the main things I pull away from this is that I'm disappointed that guys like CJ, Damian Lillard, and Tobias Harris aren't going to be able to play. Those are three of my favorite players, Uh, CJ Obviously, he hasn't really gotten the recognition I believe he deserves. He is a top five shooting guard in the NBA. I don't think there are many people who know a lot about basketball who won't say that. He's such a smart player. He's so witty. He and he has he's a great shooter. He's a he's a great shooter who can handle the ball, make plays for himself, make plays for his teammates. He's smart on defense. He's long. He's athletic, and people just don't give him the recognition he deserves. They think he's just an undersized two guard. When in reality, CJ is a great combo guard at 6'4 with long arms and, and pretty decent athleticism. I, I think he, he's he's dangerous on the court. I think he's a very dangerous player who can become a, a very good star in the, this NBA. Uh, especially this NBA with the emphasis on the three-point shot. He's a great shooter, so that translates well. All right, so I like the fact that the U.S. is having a lot of guys drop out because it gives some of the young guys, the new guys, a chance. It gives them a chance to really make a name for themselves, to play, and to get around these USA basketball coaches, these USA basketball players, and these USA basketball trainers and the facilities. And it probably gives them a taste of what the stars of the NBA have been treated like in the past few years. And and the fact that so many guys have dropped out has allowed more and more guys to come in and to see where they stack up against these elite players. And one thing that became controversial the other day is Landry Shamit, the shooting, the shooting point, sharp shooting point guard for the uh, Los Angeles Clippers. He declined to come to team USA camp. He said he's looking forward to the season and, that's okay. He, he made this decision, I think, on August 2nd, August 1st, and a few people were outraged. Bill Simmons, I know, especially was outraged because he looked at Shamit as a throw-in in the Tobias Harris trade, and because of circumstance, he came in and was able to make a name for himself in the NBA, and he he was upset because Shamit thinks, Shamit sort of thought he was too good. He thought that Shamit thought he was too good to play and to be trained around the USA basketball coaches when he hasn't exactly earned that reputation yet. And I understand that. At first, I sort of agreed with it. I liked the the post on Twitter that Bill Simmons made. But then Landry came back at him, and what Landry sort of said was he would... There would be, he would love to be there. He would love to have gone, 
But in reality, he has to pay attention to the fact that he might get injured. And the Clippers have a very important season coming up. They have a very exciting season coming up with Kawhi Leonard and Paul George leading an already solid playoff team that got two games from the Golden State Warriors, led by Lou Williams and Montrez Harrell and uh, Danilo Gallinari and those guys, even though Gallinari is gone now. He, he got traded in the Paul George trade. But with ma- those main guys coming back and Lou Williams, Montrez Harrell, Landry Shamit and a few other a few other pieces that they had on that team coming back with uh, Kawhi Leonard and Paul George they definitely believe that they have the roster uh, to compete for a championship and they don't want to risk anyone getting injured they don't want to risk anybody getting in any trouble or anybody getting involved with anything so they de- they definitely just are taking the route of being the most precautious team while they have a roster who can definitely easily compete for a championship from day one of the NBA season. So I definitely get the the I- idea of why Landry Shamit should skip out, but I, I just, in my opinion, it's an opportunity you can't give up. No matter what the injury concerns are, it's an opportunity to be around Greg Popovich and to be coached up and to learn and to grow and to be around such a great group. I don't I don't see that as an opportunity to pass up. Of course, Landry does. He's his own man. He makes his own decision. I respect it. So on the topic of USA basketball, I'm going to take a minute to just talk about one of my biggest pet peeves about USA basketball, even though it's been a great resource for a lot of players. Uh, Mr. Colangelo taking care of everyone and being the director. He's done a great job. He's th- Obviously, they've won the past three World Cups. They've won the past three Olympic gold medals. So they're doing something right at USA Basketball. They're bringing in some of the best talent in the world and they're developing it throughout the years. And guys love to put that USA across their chest. So obviously they're doing great thing. But one of my, one of my biggest pet peeves about it is that they strip all of the NBA talent and the USA Basketball is so prestigious that it just doesn't become a competition sometimes. You know, with guys like the Gasol twins, thankfully, back in uh, 2008 and 2012, they were able to pose a threat to the United States. But unless you have like an all, a couple of all-star caliber players on your team and you're a foreign country that isn't the U.S., you're not, you don't really have a chance to win. And it's sad to see. It's too bad because the USA will just blow some of these teams out. And the thing is, is not all of these guys are American. Not all of these guys were born in America. Not all of these guys have American parents. Not all of these guys should be representing the United States of America. So you have guys who could possibly have played for different countries and different teams. And maybe their country didn't just didn't have a team or they don't identify as being a part of that country. But if you were born in the country or if your parents are descendants from that country, I think you're eligible to play. I don't know the exact rules about being eligible to play in the FIBA World Cup, but I do know that there are some rules in place that would allow some of these players to play for other countries. Kyrie Irving, for example, he was born in Australia. I I don't know what the rules are out in Australia, but I'm pretty sure he would be eligible to compete for the Australian national team. And I think it would be great to see a star like that play for a different team. People forget Patrick Ewing, one of the main big guys on the USA 1992 Dream Team, he was born in Jamaica. So, in in Tim Duncan, he was born in the U.S. Virgin Islands. They weren't born on in the continental United States. And I wish that they had an opportunity to represent their country or to represent another country to where we got to see all-star players going up against all-star players, but instead we have these stacked USA teams that are going up against countries like Nigeria, who have one or two NBA players who are just role role players on the bench, while they have to go up out and score 25 points against Carmelo Anthony, LeBron James, and Dwayne Wade. And that's a tough task, especially when you have the whole country on your back and everyone's rooting for you and everyone's wanting you to do well and you just can't bring it bring it in for them and it's it's unfortunate so my idea is to have more players be more willing 
to play for these other teams in the World Cup or these other teams in the Olympics. I know that playing for USA Basketball is so prestigious and it's just a great opportunity to be involved and be around some of the best coaches in the world. But some of these other countries are in desperate need of having something to root for. And I think it would bring more parity to international basketball, the a, a much needed parity to the international basketball because the United States probably has had the roster to win the past six or seven Olympic gold medals. And uh, for one reason or another, they, it didn't go down that way. And I think that's great. You know, the United States doesn't have to win every single time, especially in the game of basketball that's growing and becoming a more global game each and every day. Now, if, if it was an American sport, like a solely American sport such as football, I would expect the United States to handle its own. I would expect the United States to dominate every other country. The only other country that would come close is Canada because they're the only country with a solid professional league. And it's it's just the fact that basketball has just become dominated by the United States. I don't want people to think that because the United the the NBA or not even just the NBA, but the game of basketball has become so global. Guys, you look at some of the top fifteen to ten players in the NBA. Guys like Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, Nikola Jokic. They they're from different countries. They grew up playing international basketball. They grew up playing for their home countries. So you want to see more parity throughout the world, and it, I don't know if we're ever going to see it, but uh, like I said, I'm still going to watch the World Cup, even though I know the United States is probably going to run away with it. Now, the reason why I think it's exciting to watch the these World Cups is because they don't always get the star players, so it's an opportunity for a guy to break out. So back in 2015, one guy that really broke out was Ke- Kenneth Fareed. Okay, he started because he was one of the few bigs on the team. They needed him. He brought a lot of energy. I remember he had full court alley oops. I remember he was blocking shots off the backboard. He was getting rebounds. He was uh, throwing down dunks. Like he was doing so many things offensively and defensively that really helped make a name, a household name for himself that probably wouldn't he wouldn't have gotten had he just played for the Denver Nuggets that season. So the fact that he went to USA Basketball, he participated in the World Cup, and he made the roster, and he did so well in the World Cup, uh, helped. He really struck a chord for me. I thought that he was great. I changed my PlayStation name to Manimal. So obviously, he he really was able to make a name for himself throughout the youth of the United States, as well as the casual NBA fan who now knows who Kenneth Fareed is, and he, so he sort of fell off as the game has progressed because it's become more of a three-point centric uh, game, and he obviously is not quite the three-point shooter that many other players have become. And with Denver acquiring Paul Millsap, he sort of got there. That's an all-star caliber player who got signed with his team, so he his role got diminished and he he sort of fell off. But when but when he signed back with uh, the the Houston Rockets this year, people he was making plays and everyone was like, "Oh, where's this guy been? I remember seeing him in the World Cup, and now he's just all of a sudden reappearing." So basketball is a game of opportunity. So if a guy doesn't have that opportunity to showcase his talents and showcase what he's able to do, there are so many guys all over the world who have the talent that LeBron James and Michael Jordan have had, who have had the athleticism of a Russell Westbrook who have had the shooting touch of a Steph Curry, but they just, if they don't have the right opportunity, if the cards don't fall right, it just doesn't work out and they're not able to showcase that at the highest level. So I think that whenever a guy gets an opportunity at this level, I think it's great. So I'm really looking forward to this World Cup. I'm waiting to see who's going to break out. My pick is that Jason Tatum makes a name for himself. I, I also think that a guy like Mason Plumlee will can make a name for himself, especially uh, with there being very few big men on the roster. Guys like Miles Turner, I, I like him. He's a he's a defensive presence who can also step out and knock down threes on the other end. And I think Kemba Walker is just gonna be a beast. So you saw how what Kyrie Irving was able to do in 2015 and run away and win the best player or most outstanding player of the World Cup award, whatever it's called. I think Kemba Walker can be that guy for the United States if he doesn't drop out. I don't know if he's going to drop out by the time this posts or anything, but as of right now, I I have it that Kemba Walker on, is currently on the roster. I don't know if that's going to change. 
But yeah, I'm definitely excited uh, to watch this year's World Cup. I'm looking for. I hope you are too. So, uh, a couple other things I want to just talk about are a couple teams who are also involved in the World Cup that are non-USA teams. So China's always a good basketball country. They produce talents such as Zhou Qi, Yi Jianlian, and Yao Ming. Uh, those guys have all played in the NBA. They're all tall. Uh, they they all have made their presence known uh, in NBA circles. So I'm excited to see what China is able to do, especially as the host country. Uh, I hope they have a good tournament. And uh, Spain is always good. They always have talent coming out of Spain. Guys like Jose Calderon, uh, Ricky Rubio, the Gasol brothers. And Sergio Baca even plays for Spain uh, because he's like a naturalized citizen there or something like that. I'm not quite sure how that works out. But Spain is another good country. Rudy Fernandez is another name that comes to mind when I think about Spain. And Canada. Canada is on the come up. Uh, they won the U19 World Championships a couple years ago, led by RJ Barrett. And they, Canada has had a new guy every year, it seems. Like, more and more talent is coming in to the NBA and circling its way through. Guys like Tyler Ennis, Corey Joseph, Andrew Wiggins, R.J. Barrett, Anthony Bennett, even though he's sort of left the NBA and now he's coming back. But the fact that he was the number one pick has really shown the talent that Canada has to offer. Uh, Steve Nash is another guy that comes to mind. Tristan Thompson, another guy that comes to mind from Canada who's been able to uh, make a name for himself. O'Shea Brissett, uh, you may not be aware of him, and Jamal Murray, who is the Denver Nuggets point guard who has definitely shown signs of being a future star in this NBA. Uh, and the fact that Canada has been able to bring so many different guys in and spit out new guys in the NBA every year is really shown that their their basketball program has really taken the steps it's needed to become a world power. So I'm excited to see what they're able to do in this World Cup. And I'm just excited to watch the World Cup in general. So I, I hope everyone else is. I'm going to tune in from the 31st through the 15th of September, the August 31st through the 15th of September. And Let's see what happens. Uh, go Team USA. Obviously, American got a root for Team USA, but like I said, those other countries are looking pretty good too. So the next thing I want to talk about was is the TBT, which is the basketball tournament. It's a competition held every year uh, for two million dollars. So where it's mostly guys who either are making the transition from NBA life to playing in overseas leagues or guys who have played division one or division two or division three at a high level. And a, a lot of these guys are pros. A lot of these guys who participate in this tournament are professional basketball players. Either some, a few of them have played in the NBA. A few of them are still in the NBA. A few of them are on uh, teams overseas. And obviously the, the big team from this tournament every year. They won it four years in a row on pace to win their fifth one tomorrow uh, and Monday is the overseas elite team. Uh, they're very good. Uh, they've had they've had success led by guys like Jeremy Pargo, Eric McCollum, DJ Kennedy, guys who have been borderline got contract guys in the NBA, guys who could probably earn a contract in the NBA, like a two-way deal or something but choose to play overseas and dominate and make over a million dollars and get the fame and the glory and the championships and the MVPs and all that types of stuff over uh, overseas. So what I love about the basketball tournament every year are the alumni teams. So there are a lot of alumni teams where a bunch of guys who played at a different school and maybe in the same era, maybe in different eras, uh, It's a, normally it's a Division One level school. Uh, they've got there's a team from Syracuse, there's a team from Ohio State, Manhattan, West Virginia, uh, Marquette, Iona. So there are a lot of, lot of really good uh, teams that play every year, and they, they bring, bring together these alumni teams, and it's just a great event. I watched the Syracuse Regional uh, last weekend and that was hosted by Bayheim's Army, the Syracuse team from Syracuse University, and that was great. Uh, it was great to see the whole community come out and support the team. It was great to see Syracuse play well and be able to... It was great to see the old players come back and 
uh, come back and be a part of the community, be a part of the group. And it's, it's just amazing to see. They unfortunately fell to brotherly love in front of an, a sea of orange and brotherly love definitely let them hear about it after the game, waving goodbye and, uh, blowing kisses to the wind and all that other stuff. And I thought that was great because that's just a part of the competition. That just shows what what a true competition is. And I, I don't have much of a problem with it. I thought that it was great. It's great to watch summer basketball at a high level. It's great to watch these teams and these fans come back together and their the fans being able to cheer on their old players that they used to uh, support. And it's it's just different. It's, it's a refreshing new take on basketball. So what I mean by that is they have a few different rules. So they go by, uh, it's it's normally played on a regulation like college court. Uh, they, they play the college three-point line. They play with uh, an Elam, what is called an Elam ending. So an Elam ending happens with uh, the first uh, dead ball or timeout in the Within the last four minutes of the game, they throw eight points up on the board of the leading team score, and whoever gets to that uh, amount wins wins the game. So they have to score a certain number of points before uh, they can the, before the to win in order to win the game. So I like it because what it does is it eliminates late game fouling, and it speeds it helps the game continue to move fast because you don't want to foul because you don't want to give a guy two free points so they, they can get closer to that target score. So the fact that there is a target score makes it every possession count more. It makes every team just want to lock down on defense because normally the mentality is, is oh, if they score two on offense, we can get a three. Or if we send them to the free throw line and he only makes one, we come down, we hit a two or three, then that's how the teams normally make their way back into the game. Now you don't want to sacrifice any points at all. So it's all about just getting a regular stop on defense. And I think it's great because it keeps the game moving. Uh, it makes it exciting for the fans. Uh, the only problem I have is sometimes games will end but right as they're starting to get good. Like a team will start to make a comeback and all of a sudden the game's over because of the Elam ending. And you never know what would have happened had they fully played out the last four minutes. So that's the only thing, that's the only gripe I really have with the situation. And other than that, I think it's just a great thing to have. I think the basketball tournament does a great job of every year of making it innovative. I know a post went viral yet last night from the dunk contest that they had. They have a defender in their dunk contest now, which is interesting. It's a new take on how to stage a basketball dunk contest. And I thought that was interesting. I thought it was good to see teams really are good to see players go in there with just for ferocity. And normally you, you like to see a player like glide through the air in a dunk contest. But with the added defender it makes them more aggressive it makes them work harder to get the dunk down it makes them less focused on their style and more focused on the power and athleticism that it really takes to throw down a, a vicious slam so i i think it's it's a great take on basketball uh, it's great to see some of these guys be able to win some money because you're it's basically two weeks of basketball and these guys are making uh the winner the winning team has split up two million dollars so for two weeks of basketball, you're making two hundred, one hundred fifty to two hundred thousand dollars for just playing for two weeks, and I think, hey, that's an easy payday for me, you know. So I'm glad that they're able to do that, and make some money out of it. Uh, I hope that they can continue to put the price up, so maybe a team is able to, at uh, one day they'll be playing for five million dollars, and that they split up, split that up throughout the the players and coaches on the, each team, and. I think it's great. I think it's an overall great experience. I hope it gets bigger and better and continues to grow because it's entertainment. It's summer. It's midsummer entertainment that we need. We're able to see players who haven't really gotten the shot in the NBA that they possibly deserve or that they were going to get, but they weren't able to live up to the potential of it. And it's great to see just them back out on the court. Uh, like I said, summer basketball and it's it's a great it's just an overall it's different which makes it, it which makes it good for basketball it's good for fans it's good for the players so uh, the basketball tournament if you haven't checked it out please check it out uh, there 
they uh, will be playing the championship game tomorrow on Sunday, August 5th, and the or the semifinals on Sunday, August 5th, and then the finals, I think, are on Monday, August 6th. So I would definitely check that out if I were you. Or Sunday, August 4th, my bad. I got the... I get the dates wrong. I'm, I apologize for that. Well, so the August 4th, check it out. Uh, I'll try to get this podcast up by the time uh, that game starts. So uh, whoever's listening will have a chance to go check that out. Uh, but now I just wanted to give my thoughts on the NBA, what has gone on in the NBA that I haven't really covered in the past couple of weeks. So what has been going on is Russell Westbrook was traded to the Rockets for Chris Paul and a bunch of draft picks. Uh, It just makes me feel bad for Chris Paul. Uh, He still has a lot left in the tank. Uh, He, you saw him working out a couple weeks ago with Drew Hanlon and he was playing one-on-ones with Bradley Beal and Jason Tatum. And he made this insane behind the back spin move in straight into a jump shot. That was so smooth. So silky that you just thought, yeah, that's vintage Chris Paul right there. Able to dazzle us with his handles and his amazing scoring ability, as well as his playmaking, but you don't really get to see that in a one-on-one. And I, I just, I feel bad for him. I hope he can find a place to, to where he can still contend and a, a place where he'll, he'll be happy. So it's not looking like he's going to get traded as of right now, even though I know Oklahoma City will want to trade him. Uh, they traded Russell Westbrook to help uh, prepare for the future. They obviously got a bunch of draft picks back. They got a bunch of draft picks back from the Paul George trade. So uh, Oklahoma City is just rebuilding. You know, they had all the talent in the world. If you look back at their roster back in 2011, Serge Ibaka, who's a world champion now, Russell Westbrook, who's been an MVP since then, Kevin Durant, who's been a two-time finals MVP and a world, cha- and a world champion uh, since then, James Harden, who's been the scoring champ every year, he's been top two in MVP, he's won an MVP, so you look at all the talent that they had back on that 2011 roster, had they were able to keep that all together, I don't know if they'd be able to pay for it, especially in a market like Oklahoma City, but it would have been amazing to watch all those guys play to their true potential once they got older, but you know, things happen for a reason, Uh, players have changed their heart. Coaches have changed their heart. General managers have changed their heart. So you just have to trust the idea that each player wants to do what's best for them in their situation. So I I can do nothing but respect that. I I just want to give credit to Houston, though, in this trade. Uh, It means they're fearless. They're always working. Credit to Daryl Morey, the Houston Rockets general manager, who said it, who went on the record over a year ago and said he is determined to beat the Warriors. He's determined to make the Rockers Rockets into NBA contenders, and they have been the past couple of years, but he's determined to get them to not only a conference finals again, but to get them to an NBA finals. And I think they have the roster to do that. Uh, definitely with James Harden and Russell Westbrook, they seem a bit top-heavy, but they still have pieces. They still have Clint Capella. They still have P.J. Tucker. They still have Eric Gordon. Guys who are solid and know how to play their roles, and they fit well with guys like Russell Westbrook and James Harden. So I wish the Rockets nothing but the best. I hope they don't beat my Sixers. But I just think this is a good move for the NBA because it brings more pairs, more an- another solid duo, if you were to say, because uh, that's what everyone is calling the NBA, the league of duos, a lot of uh, pairs who are all-star caliber players, such as LeBron James, Anthony Davis, Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, Joel Embiid, Ben Simmons, and so on. So the fact that this creates another solid duo, uh, obviously good for the NBA. And it, it it's amazing to see what the Rockets are able to do every summer. It seems like every sum, summer they're doing something. Last summer they were recruiting LeBron, if you if you remember. So they offered four first rounders for Jimmy Butler at the beginning of the season. And the fact that they're constantly tweaking their roster to get better, you can do just, just do nothing but respect it. Because in this game, at the end of the day, we're all just trying to have fun and get better. So I thank you for listening. I hope everyone comes back soon and listens to my next pod next podcast i'll be back soon with more basketball content i hope that you just like this video uh, please uh, send it to your friends send it to whoever's a basketball fan basketball junkie in your family i hope that you like what you hear come back uh, i just want to say thank you again thank you for listening all right see you guys <laughs>